Hi, I'm Montana York, and I'm your host here at Cambridge House. I'm joined today by the one and only Jeffrey Christian, Managing Partner at the CPM Group. Jeff, thank you for being here. It's good to be back. Yeah. Great to have you back. Um, Jeff, recently you've stated that the U.S. defense contractors, the dollar politicians, they're who's truly winning this war, and I'd love to dissect that with you. Okay, I'm not quite sure where to start. I mean, look, my view is that Putin was ill-advised to start this war, and he has uh, prosecuted it very poorly. It's been devastating for the Russian military. It's devastating for the Russian economy, and it's devastating for Russia's place in the world, uh, which is really what he was striving for. And, and I think what you'll find is that Russia will be a pariah state uh, for an extended period of time. I am now investing in contemporary art. And why? Because the dozens of billionaires and multimillionaires that I've had on this show, they do it too. I'm just following the leader. Since the mid 90s, contemporary art prices and appreciation have actually outpaced the total return of the S&P 500 by 164%. I want a piece of that action. So the way I do it is through a platform called Masterworks. They allow me to buy fractional ownership in those classic names, the multi-million dollar paintings by artists like Monet, Picasso, Andy Warhol, etc. If that painting is sold after I buy my ownership as a part owner, I get paid out on that sale. Or if I just want to liquidate my position prior to, I can do so on the Masterworks secondary market. Personally, I don't intend on that. I dollar cost average in. I intend to part cash there for the long term. If you're interested, check out masterworks.io and follow me down this path. The big winners are the US government, NATO, I mean, you know, there was talk, is NATO really uh, relevant anymore? That talk didn't really extend to major policymakers below like the presidential level. I mean, Trump was talking about it, but the military and the State Department were not saying that. And NATO and European governments definitely were not saying that. You know, you've seen NATO expand uh, enormously over the last 20 years, which is one of Putin's major complaints. Uh, uh, but uh, so NATO wins, the U.S. government wins, the U.S. dollar will be strong because the dollar's major competition is the euro. You know, and if you look at just central bank foreign exchange reserves, the dollar is 60 percent of it, euro is 20 percent of it. Everything else is another 20 percent. So the euro is going to be under pressure because of its proximity to a defanged, ultimately defanged Russia that will still harbor all sorts of paranoid uh, delusions and anger toward the West uh, for a long time. So the dollar will benefit. Um, and then U.S. military contractors and European military contractors will, will win because they're getting hundreds of billions of dollars of armaments resupply contracts already. You know, if you fast forward a few years, you know, NATO will expand further. It's already, you know, got three of the former Soviet republics, the, the Baltic states, in. Uh, Sweden, you know, 180 years of neutrality, now wants to join. Finland wants to join. It's got 80 years of neutrality. Uh, Moldova, and, you know, ultimately whatever is left of Ukraine will probably join too. So NATO is going to be the big benefit, Sherry here. China's watching. Uh, China is taking very close notes to see how the world reacts to Russian military aggression uh, because they want to know what to expect if they tried military aggression. I don't think I think there, there's a there's a, a cultural psychic difference between Russians and Chinese. And there that is interpreted and reflected in the political culture and the foreign affairs uh, relationship. And Russia has always been much more militaristic. And China, you know, while it's had its militaristic bouts, uh, they haven't gone well. And if you talk to Chinese government officials and you talk about, well, you know, putting the squeeze on North Korea or being more aggressive toward Taiwan or looking at the southern tier of, of Asian states that they share borders with, you know, the 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 Pater Noster that you hear from Chinese officials over and over again is we have tried to be involved in other countries' domestic affairs in the past, and it has never ended well. So we really don't want countries trying to interfere with our domestic policies, and we don't necessarily want to interfere with their domestic policies. So I think China is watching very closely. Um, 
to see how it all shakes out. Great. And um, I heard you think the euro is going to go down, the U.S. dollar is going to go up. Any further market predictions on how this ends? Well, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of things that will be going on. One of the things is that you probably will see more money spent on alternative energy technologies. Uh, that's not necessarily meaning that the, those alternative energy technologies will move forward any faster, but you're going to see a greater proclivity toward finding that kind of issue. Uh, you know, and you also see probably greater uh, issues related to uh, material security, um, resource nationalism on the one side, finding strategic reserves of metals on the other side, and things like that. So I think that you'll see some metals benefit, uh, and you'll see uh, the dollar benefit. That's you know probably the major things that you'll see. And uh, we do just touched on major metals, uh, platinum, palladium, copper. What are your predictions there? Our expectation is that platinum prices are, are hey, you know, they've started to rise. We, we, had, we had started recommending platinum investors a few years ago. And we said, you know, it's been in this $800 to $1,000 range. It's going to break out of that. It's going to move slowly but steadily upward. And we still think that that's the case. So we've seen the price spike up to 1300 early last year, came back down to below 900 Now it's back above 1000 I think ultimately 1000 is the base. Palladium, we had expected the price to decline this year, and we still expect the price to decline. But obviously, because you know 40% of world palladium uh, comes from Russia, and there are supply questions and concerns, uh, you've got a new premium placed on palladium. Ultimately, as the Russian invasion of Ukraine is resolved one way or another, that military premium will come off of palladium and we think the price will come back off uh, because you're seeing this shift away from palladium intense catalysts to plat uh, more platinum intense catalysts in automobile catalysts. Uh, copper, it's interesting, you know, uh, we have been we are EV realists. You know, it's not that we're negative on EVs, but we look at projections of how fast you can build an EV industry and how fast you can build EVs. And, and, and you know, there are all sorts of headwinds there. And, and there's a lot of bullishness that we've seen over the last few years about copper because of the electrification of society and the movement toward electric vehicles. And I think that those headwinds will slow the increase in demand for copper. And I also think that there is a tremendous amount of copper out there that can be mined in mineable reserves and resources. Um, and, and so I don't know that I'm as bullish on copper as a lot of people think. And I think that you could see a period of time in the mid, mid decade of the 2020s, uh, where copper actually kind of treads water price wise, simply because the demand is not rising as fast as people thought, but the supply is starting to come on stream. Okay, and then we touched on the Russia-Ukrainian resolve. Um, I'd love to hear any forecasts you have there or what your predictions are. Oh, <laughs> I'm not so foolish as to say that I'm going to project how a war ends. But right. what I do do is, is uh, scenario planning. And right. I like right. scenarios. And mm -hmm. you can see the, the, the Soviet poster behind me or the bottom <laughs> of it. You know, I studied Soviet politics and Chinese politics in, in university mm -hmm. a long, long time ago. Um, and and I, we often talk about what we call Soviet style planning. You know, Soviet style planning was you create contingencies and what will you do if this happens? And that way, no one's ever responsible for a mistake. So, you know, they went into Afghanistan big time because they had various contingencies. And they said, if the Afghan, <clears throat> uh, the, what became the Taliban, if the Afghan rebels do certain things, we will send in the troops full time. Mm -hmm. And they did it. So it was nobody's decision and nobody's fault that that happened. That's, yeah, that's contingency planning. Mm -hmm. uh, but I look at the scenarios. Like a, first one is uh, you have a protracted stalemate. And, and ultimately, you know, if the Russians ultimately take over all or part of the Ukraine, as long as they're there, they're going to have insurrectionists. They'll call them terrorists. They're going to have people shooting cop, Russian cops and soldiers on the street, slitting their throats, blowing up police stations, whatever it takes. So if the Russians win, you're going to have this protected 
protracted period of time where there's insecurity in Europe, militarily and politically. Uh, it's good for NATO. It's good for the defense. It's good for the dollar. And you'll see that build up. If uh, they ultimately are forced to withdraw, uh, then you know you have a defanged Russia for a while and a pariah state Russia, uh, and you start having this massive rebuilding of the Ukraine. Um, and you know we have various countries have frozen about three hundred billion dollars of central Russian central bank reserve dollar uh, dollars and euro reserves. There's another estimated two hundred billion in yuan at the Bank of People's Bank of China. Uh, that the People's Bank of China is not releasing because they say they don't want to run a fall of global sanctions against Russia. So there's like $500 billion of Russian government money that's frozen offshore that can be used to rebuild the Ukraine under reparations if it goes that way. You know? But you know, the three scenarios are Russia wins and then they face an extended insurrection. Uh, the, there's a stalemate and it goes on for a, a long, long time. We have North and South Korea as an example of how bad that can be. Um, or that they get beaten back, uh, you know, and that's a scenario that you have to consider because, you know, the, the, the historic model is Bosnia. You know, the United States went to NATO when the Serbians were starting to kill Bosnian Muslims. 1994, whenever it was. And so NATO should step in. Yugoslavia is not a NATO member, but they're our next door neighbor. And uh, this is a humanitarian crisis. And the European members of NATO said no. Now, if Clinton had said, okay, and pivoted to the Arab League and said, NATO doesn't want to go in, but we think this is a humanitarian crisis. We think we should go in. Do you want to join us? That would have completely changed the dynamics between the Muslim world and the United States. But he didn't. We waited two years, allowed 100,000 some odd people to be murdered by the Serbs, uh, and then we went in. Yeah. So at some point, we may wind up going in. And if we're smart, we'll go in sooner rather than later. Uh, and uh, when that ha if that happens, obviously the prices of precious metals rise sharply for a time, uh, and then you have a much more devastating resolution for the Soviet Union. I mean, Russia. <laughs> um, okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, if my viewers wanted to hear more uh, or find anything else from you, Jeff, where would they find you? Well, it's www.cpmgroup.com. We will be launching our gold year book on April 6th. And you can go someplace or other and find, actually, we, we do biweekly YouTube videos. And in the YouTube video that was just posted today, the 22nd of March, there is a URL that you can register to uh, attend our online briefing on April 6th. And there's another URL where you can buy the gold yearbook. Uh, and then we'll be doing our, Mar our silver yearbook in early May and our PGM yearbook in uh, late June. But you can go to our website and you can read all about our stuff. There's a lot of free reads there. There are past videos, past presentations, various reports. Uh, you know, there's a report from 1999, I think, uh, where we were advising the gold industry about inve uh, promoting investment demand instead of jewelry demand if they wanted to drive the price higher. Uh, there's another one from around 2002 uh, related to regulating OTC derivative markets, uh, which is the very, it's called two letters about derivatives or something like that. It's a very interesting historical insight into the politics behind the lack of derivatives regulations up until recently. Uh, so there's a lot of free reads on our website. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Jeffrey. Always a pleasure.